the top 10 controversies about multiple sclerosis. This is gonna be good. Number one, escalation therapy versus induction therapy. We're blessed with more than 40 drugs that have been used as disease-modifying therapies in MS, but there's a problem. The stronger agents tend to be more toxic. There's sort of a correlation between efficacy and safety. For example, glutiram or acetate is very safe, low risk of serious side effects, but it's not all that effective. On the contrary, drugs such as Limtrada are very effective but have significant risks like weakening the immune system, causing infections, and secondary autoimmune diseases. So let's say you're a young person with newly diagnosed relapsing MS. What should you do? Should you go slow, take a conservative approach, a safe medication, and maybe if you don't do well, you can always escalate to a stronger medication later on. This is known as escalation therapy. Of course, this is safer, but you're risking getting a relapse, maybe acquiring new disabilities, and perhaps portending a worse prognosis later on. On the contrary, you could go for an induction approach. Take a stronger medication, Ocrevus, Limtrada. Hey, why not hematopoietic stem cell transplant? You take additional risk, but maybe you would do better in the long run. Of course, the problem is the side effects are no joke, and you may be taking something that you don't need. After all, I have patients who take low efficacy medications or even no medication and do well for decades. There's increasing evidence that the induction approach, the more aggressive approach may be better. This is a meta-analysis you're looking at of several observational studies suggesting that at least on the average, people taking induction therapies tend to do better. But this is not a randomized trial. And in fact, we have two ongoing randomized trials where people will be randomized to induction or escalation approaches. They're called the treat MS and deliver MS trials. So we may get a more definitive answer. Number two, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. If induction is good, why not go for the strongest treatment right away? I previously did an analysis of different head-to-head -head trials, link in the description below, and I ranked HSCT as likely the most effective treatment in MS, so why not just go for it right away, or at least consider it early in the course of the disease when it's most effective. Although it's not a stem cell treatment per se, it's really the chemotherapy drugs and the conditioning regimen that wipe out the immune system and drive the therapeutic effect, but it can be incredibly effective, sometimes inducing long-term, even indefinite remission, and you may not need to take future therapies. Of course, there is a catch, which is the side effect of the drugs. A lot of these drugs can significantly weaken the immune system and cause infections and also cause other side effects, such as infertility, depending on the unique conditioning regimen. Also, there's evidence that stronger conditioning regimens like BEAM are more effective in the long run on average than weaker conditioning regimens, such as Cytoxan plus ATG. So how aggressive exactly are you going to be? Number three, CCSVI. This is chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency. In 2008, an Italian vascular surgeon, Dr. Paolo Zamboni, proposed a new hypothesis for the pathogenesis of MS, that it wasn't caused by an abnormal immune system, but rather abnormal veins in the head and neck, causing congestion and increased pressure in the veins. And maybe immune infiltration into the brain and spine was a secondary phenomenon. After all, it's well known that the lesions in MS primarily occur around the post capillary venules as shown here. He did a famous study showing a very strong correlation between the presence of venous abnormalities in the head and neck and multiple sclerosis. And many people were having interventions, so-called liberation therapies, angioplasties, to open up veins and stenting procedures. And some reported incredible results, including some very prominent people, such as Matt Embry and Montel Williams. However, subsequent randomized trials were not so clear, and the treatment is widely regarded to be unproven. But even today, there are some steadfast proponents. Number four, the cost of MS drugs. These disease-modifying therapies are ridiculously expensive. Take a look at this graph of the cost of different DMTs over the last several decades. You can see as more and more drugs are coming onto the market with more competition, the price is actually going up. 
That's strange. This so-called shadow pricing, copying the price of other drug companies, greatly outpacing the rate of inflation, is completely legal and common practice. It's particularly bad in the United States. Take a look at a single dose of Avonex, the price in different countries, the United States and other countries. This is perhaps one of the least effective disease-modifying therapies. And it doesn't just affect insurance companies because they fight back as well and introduce co-pays so people with MS can't afford their drugs or step therapy or other restrictions. And it makes it very difficult for doctors and patients to have choices of the medication that's right for them. Number five, Me Too drugs. You'd think at the cost of these disease-modifying therapies, we'd be getting new, innovative drugs that have never been seen before. That is true sometimes. For instance, Tysavri was truly a new, unique, and innovative drug. But many of these new drugs are essentially copies of older drugs that have been used in MS and other autoimmune diseases. For instance, if you look at this chart, Ocrevus is a drug that depletes B lymphocytes. But this strategy has been used for decades in MS. Rituximab has the same activity and in fact binds to the same receptor on B lymphocytes, CD20, and has been used in MS since the early 2000s. In fact, clinical data, for instance, Ocrevus in the Oratorio study in primary progressive MS and Rituximab in the Olympus trial used in primary progressive MS have very, very similar results. Take a look at Abagio and Arava, the enormous greater than $100,000 per year cost of the drug, and they have the exact same active ingredient. Think about a 20-year-old taking this drug for 40 years until age 60. That's a $4 million difference what exactly are we getting for that $4 million? Number six, nutrition and MS. Is there a best diet for MS? There are various proponents of different diets which contradict each other. For instance, Dr. Roy Swank believed in a low saturated fat diet. Dr. Terry Walls believes in a modified paleo diet. In the best bet diet promoted by Dr. Ashton Embry, there's sort of a combination of those two types of diets. And in the book, Overcome Coming multiple sclerosis, they recommend a whole foods plant-based diet plus seafood. Who's right? There are tons of anecdotes supporting all of these diets. There are some observational studies that could point us in a certain direction and a few small randomized trials, but nothing really definitive. No one knows for sure if there's a single best diet for MS, but there are some new ongoing randomized trials that could give us some more information. Number seven, what about other environmental factors? If you look at this map of the prevalence of MS throughout the world, you'll see that the prevalence varies tremendously. For example, in Cuenca, Ecuador, the risk is only 1 in 25,000, but in Syracuse, New York, it's 1 in 222, a more than 100-fold difference. Also, there's evidence that the prevalence of MS is increasing over time, particularly in developing countries like Mexico and India. So something must be making MS more common. But what is it? Is it nutrition? Is it that we're too clean, we don't get exposed to parasites when we're young, and that changes the development of the immune system? Do we not get enough sunlight exposure? Are we too stressed out? Is there a difference in diagnostic criteria? Do we just have more MRI machines, or are there other toxins or other aspects of modern society? No one exactly knows for sure, but something must be making it more common. Number eight, the cause of progressive multiple sclerosis. Some people, as they get older with MS, are very stable, but others have a slow, insidious, progressive worsening of symptoms, and to their frustration, their MRI scans, at least on conventional MRI, the lesions may look exactly the same. So why exactly are they getting worse? There are various theories. Some people believe there's a low-level smoldering inflammation within the old lesions, invisible to conventional 
functional MRI, possibly detectable through multimodal MRI and other means such as specialized PET scans. This inflammation may not be driven by T and B lymphocytes, the traditional targets of our disease-modifying therapy, but rather different aspects of the immune system, such as the innate immune system, such as macrophages and microglia, and perhaps we need new drug targets to treat this more effectively. There's also some evidence that the problem may be within the cell, within the neuron. There may be an energy failure of the cell, and there's evidence of dysfunction of the mitochondria, the energy-producing organelle within the cell. Yet another idea is that the inflammation is gone. The forest fire is out, but the trees are falling down. Perhaps a lot of the injury to the brain occurs early in the course of multiple sclerosis, but a young person, a young healthy person can compensate for it well. But with natural aging, there's a decreased ability to compensate for injury to the nervous system. And some people have described MS as an accelerated aging process. Is it one of these factors that's driving progressive MS, a combination of these factors, or something I didn't mention, the debate still ensues. Number nine, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, the virus which causes mono or glandular fever, is linked to multiple sclerosis. People who had clinical mono, you know, the kissing disease that makes you sleepy, they have double the risk of MS, and virtually 100% of adults with MS have antibodies in their blood suggesting they've been infected in the past, compared to 95% of the general population without MS. So it's a very common finding. But there's specific evidence that it's likely part of the cause of MS in terms of the timing of infection relative to the onset of MS symptoms and elevation of serum neurofilament, a marker of damage to the central nervous system. However, there's a small chance that it could be reverse causation. Maybe MS changes the immune system and makes us more likely to have these changes and these antibodies in the first place. I think there is increasing evidence that it is part of the causal pathway, but what do we do about it? Can we even stop Epstein-Barr virus? Over 50% of five-year-olds have been exposed to the virus, so we perhaps we would have to intervene early with a vaccine. There's a product being developed called ATA-188 in clinical trials right now in immunotherapy against the virus, but will it work or is it too late? Has the virus already done its damage and changed the immune system forever? I think we'll get some answers over time. Number 10, and this is super controversial, is the use of disease-modifying therapies in older people with MS. If you look at clinical trials in MS, often there's an age cutoff where people over age 55 are excluded from the trial. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is that drug companies want to make their drug look good, and older people are more likely to get various medical conditions like heart disease and cancer, and they want to simplify the study and avoid any potential association of a bad outcome with their drug drug. Also, people who are older are more likely to have more disability, and because of the nature of the EDSS scale often used in MS research, it sometimes can be difficult to measure a difference in people who are using gait-assistive devices such as a cane. The result is that we have very limited actual clinical randomized data in older people with multiple sclerosis. In general with MS, people who are younger are more likely to have clinical attacks, relapses, flares, and new MRI lesions. As people get older, they can be stable or have slowly progressive MS, but they're less likely to have new attacks and new lesions. And because many disease-modifying therapies work on inflammation, some have suggested that they may be less effective in people who are older. And there are some observational studies that suggest this is true. Also, for people who are older, there may be a greater risk of taking certain immunosuppressant medications, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in terms of urinary tract infection, pneumonia, and other infections in general. So some have suggested there may be a change in the risk-benefit profile as people get older, particularly with newer, stronger medications that have a risk of weakening the immune system. So what exactly should you do? Is there any evidence? Well, this observational study looked at people who are older with so-called burnt-out multiple sclerosis, average age 60, 
one, and they found that most people stopping the medication did pretty well, though a small number did have relapses and new MRI lesions, but it was less than 5%. There is a randomized trial called DISCO-MS where people over age 55 with MS were actually randomized to continue or stop the medication. This is a better methodology because people who stop medication voluntarily outside of a trial may do so for a specific reason. They found that 4.7% of people who continued the medication had new disease activity defined as new lesions or relapses compared to 12% of people who discontinued medication. So that's a pretty significant difference. However, if they looked at disability progression, there was no statistically significant difference, but this was a relatively short study and there's an extension phase underway. To this day, there's a lot of controversy on this topic. Some doctors would be more conservative and want to avoid medication unless it's definitively proven in that specific age group, where other doctors are vehemently opposed to stopping medication based on age. So if you want more information, definitely check out some references below and links to related videos that I discussed. And I'd love to know your opinion on these controversies in the comments below. And are there others that I left out? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?